I'm Willie Banks, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first SimPlot Games virtual clinic. You know, it's awesome to be together again. Boy, this pandemic has really put a, a, a pain in everybody's get along. So it's, it's, of course, not the same as being in that chilly Holt arena in February, but it's good to be together virtually to talk about the sport that we all love. Now, we have an exciting day planned for you, and we are going to share lots of thoughts, tips, and advice to help you and your team improve your approach and your performance. And you know, it wouldn't be a Simplot Games event without a little fun. So I'm looking forward to that. Now today, I'm joined today by several Olympians who are ready to share their expertise and perspective with you. And I'd first like to introduce one of the one of my good buddies, uh, Dick Fosbury, who he's joining us from his home in Idaho. And as you know, as a high school athlete in Medford, Oregon, he developed a new jump technique that became known as the Fosbury flop. He took his new jumping style to Oregon State University, and then in 1968, he won an Olympic gold medal in Mexico City. You know, his style was a little bit unorthodox, and many doubted the new style. Heck, I, I still doubt the style, but, you know, whatever. But he used it to win two collegiate national championships and the 1968 Olympic gold medal. Who knew? Where he set an Olympic record of seven feet four and a quarter inches. With all that hardware, it, it didn't take long until everyone in the world, uh, except maybe Willie Banks, was doing the Fosbury Flop. Dick is also the chairman of the Simplot Games. Uh, he's a licensed civil engineer and is currently serving on the Blaine County uh, Commission as the, commis as the Blaine County Commissioner in Idaho. Let's welcome Dick Fosbury. Now, for those of you who don't know, you have a little emotion emoticon down at the bottom. You click on that and out comes something and you can use the little clap icon to, to show your emotions. Looking forward Thanks, to it. Thanks, Willie. Thank You're you, welcome. Willie. Now, next I wanna introduce Dr. Andre Phillips. He's here uh, virtually from California. He is uh, an assist. He's he's a uh, he used to be an assistant high school principal. I'm, I think he's now the principal, and may have moved into uh, administration. Is that correct, Andre? That is correct. I'm a director of uh, student and family support services now. I've moved up late. <laughs> that that always you're always you know you're always an inspiration, Andre. So Andre and I both went to the great school of UCLA. Go Bruins! And Andre in 1981 was the NC2A champion of the 400 meter hurdle. And he was ranked in the top 10 in the world in the 400 meter hurdles for nine years and actually was number one for three of those years. In 1988, Andre was, uh, won the Olympic gold medal in the 400 meter hurdles with a time of 47 minutes, 19 seconds. To give you an idea of how versatile this young man is, in 1985, Andre was ranked in the top three in the world in the 400 meter hurdles, the 110, uh, meter, uh, 110 hurdles, high hurdles, and in the open 400. Welcome, Andre Phillips. Thank you, Willie. Our next Olympian is Stacy Dragilla. Now, Stacy began her track and field career as a heptathlete. So she knows sprinting, hurdling, high jumping, long jumping, shot putting, throwing, the javelin. The only thing she doesn't know is the triple jump. Yeah, who can't, you know, she can't be a genius in everything. While competing for Idaho State University, she was uh, convinced to try the pole vault. And the rest is history. Stacy is a pioneer in the pole vault, winning the first women's gold medal in the Olympic Games in Sydney in 2000. She's a three-time world champion, a 17-time national champion, and set 10 world records. Woof, tiring. 
Sorry. Her personal best is 15 feet, 10 inches. Now she is coaching vaulters. She's got her own facility in Idaho, in Boise, and she's helping to grow our sport by promoting the sport of stick jumping in elementary and middle schools. Now, please welcome the fabulous Stacy Dragilla. Yay, Stacy. And for anyone interested in throwing, Ian Waltz is here. Now, Ian and I go way back. He, he used to be in uh, San Diego, in fact, where I am now. Ian grew up, however, in uh, Post Falls, Idaho. Sorry about that, Ian. And competed at Washington State University. He won the high school state titles in shot put and discus and also played the fullback and defensive end in football. And if you look at him, you can tell he was a pretty strong dude. He still holds the Idaho State High School discus record at 203 feet, 9 inches. He's an eight-time collegiate All-American in the shot and discus, a two-time national champion in the discus, and he competed in the 2004 and 2008 Olympic Games. His personal best in the discus was 68 meters, 91. That's 226 feet, one inch. Today, Ian is a firefighter and emergency medical technician in Boise area where he lives with Stacy DeGrilla, his wife. <laughs> so good to have you, Ian. It's good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Looking forward to the clinic. All righty. Now, please join me again in welcoming all our guest clinicians. At this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to my good buddy, Dick Fosbury, to do, introduce our final clinician and keynote speaker. Thank you, Willie Banks, uh, so much. Um, pretty good job. You didn't mess up too bad. Um, all in all, a very good job. And, and um, before I introduce John Register, I do want to say a few words about our host, uh, Willie Banks. Uh, Willie is a three-time Olympian in the triple jump and a member of the National USA Track and Field Hall of Fame. He set the world record 1986 with a mark of 58, 11 and a quarter inches. And then he's also well known in, in track circles as having invented the clap, the rhythmic clap that, that um, all of us enjoy when we're out there on the field and clapping together, um, trying to, to motivate and inspire those athletes who are jumping, throwing, vaulting, and, and running, uh, as well as on track, uh, his contributions to the sport. He's, uh, he's been a leader in a number of organizations. Uh, he's a past president of the U.S. Olympians and, and Paralympians and currently is an elected officer on the World Athletics Council, which governs international track and field. So Willie, thank you for all you've done with the, the uh, with the games and with our sport and helping to pull this clinic together. Thank you, Willie. And then I, I, I'm really excited about this. Um, we have included Olympians with Simplot Games for a long time. And a number of years ago, we started to uh, have a couple of Paralympian athletes come and enjoy and even give an exhibition going back to Marlon Shirley, who was a gold medalist in 2000 when, uh, when Stacy was jumping down there. And John is a really special guest for us. I'm really pleased. Uh, like uh, most of us, he began uh, in different sports and started out as a competitive swimmer and then uh, played basketball uh, or baseball and football. He was an outstanding track and field athlete and went to the University of Arkansas where he's a four-time All-American as a hurdler. 
long jumper, and a sprinter. Following college, he enlisted in the U.S. Army, served for six years, including tours in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Then he qualified for the U.S. trials for the Olympic Games in 1988 in the 110 hurdles, and then again he moved on in 92 to, to uh, qualify for the 400 meter hurdles. Rather than, than tell more about his inspirational story, I'd like to turn the time over to John so he can tell you in his own words. And as John speaks, you're certainly welcome to enter questions in the chat box located down. Uh, it's The chat box is on the right. Just click on the chat button at the uh, bottom line of your screen uh, using this Zoom platform. So everyone, please join me and let's welcome this morning's keynote speaker, John Register. Hey, welcome everybody, Dick Fosbury. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm so glad to be back in Idaho, by Colorado Springs, by UCLA, <laughs> by <laughs> all of them, everybody. I really am so excited to see everyone here I mean, look, we got a rock star crew here. We got Stacy's here, Willie's here, Andre, Dick, Ion. I mean, this, this is great. So what I'm going to uh, talk to you about today, and if you don't, if you can't really see me big, then uh, you want to pin me or, or, or highlight me and as, as I've been right now. So we're going to be talking about this hurdling adversity, amputating our fear and embracing this new normal mindset, because all of us have gone through something this year, this past year, which has shifted us. It's we had to we overcome. We had to adapt. And a lot of times Paralympians have to over adapt a lot. Olympians as, as well. But when you when you have an incident that when you're training for one thing and all of a sudden, you know, your Olympic trials qualifier and then. You, you lose a leg and you become a Paralympic medalist, there's a lot that goes on in how we have to adapt. I just want to share some of those lessons I learned uh, in, this, in this quick uh, little presentation we're going to share with you today. So I think the, the first thing really when we're talking about this is how do we embrace a new normal mindset? Well, the first thing is I think we have to look at our atmosphere and our environment. As you see these astronauts underneath the the water, right? They're, they're practicing maneuvers and they have frog people with them as well. And when I was down in NASA, they took us over to that ginormous pool and, they, and they, we saw the whole International Space Station submerged under the water. And, we, and as that picture showed, you could see all of them doing their maneuvers underneath the water that they're going to do in space. And when they're in space flying above us at 144,000 miles an hour at the International Space Station, they're operating in an environment too, which is which is kind of really harsh. But is the is the environment harsh? Was my question. And as I left the pool that day and went back over to NASA's headquarters, I began thinking about what I just saw: astronauts underneath the water, astronauts in space. In both of those environments, it was illegal for them to operate. It was illegal for them to operate. Why? Because underwater we can't breathe. We can't breathe water in that in that liquid form. And in space, there is no oxygen. But the environments are the environments. We just have to show up in the environments by bringing our oxygen into that space, into that place. So what happens when we lose our oxygen out of our environment? If we can think back to March of 2020, a lot of us lost our oxygen out of our environment. A, a, a swimmer that can't get their breath or underneath the water, held underneath there too long, is about to maybe drown. The last thing they do is they begin to do what? Put that in the chat. If you see me watching over here, uh, hey, Tyson, it's great to see you back too. I'm just looking at my chat box over there. So what's the last thing a swimmer will do uh, or a person that's in the water and they're being held underneath too long? What's the thing that they do? What's, what's, the, what's, the, um, what's the reaction that they have at that, at that point in time? I'll, I'll wait for you all to put something in the chat box so I know y'all can, I can see it, right? Panic, yes, yeah, Scott says panic. 100% they panic. So lifeguards are trained to come up from behind that individual. So they do not come in front of the panicked individual. We also saw um, during COVID, when it first hit, people panicked. They lost their oxygen out of their environment. How do I know this? Because we saw certain things happen in our society across the United States. 
People made runs on toilet paper, on paper products, on hand sanitizers. I don't want anybody else to have it. I need it all for myself. I need to hoard it. And we began panicking because we lost our oxygen out of our environment. And I think, I believe what really needs to happen is we have to shift our mindset. And many of us did. We adapted to the normalities of what we thought we actually could control when we're spinning out of control. How many have ever said this statement? I can't wait, wait till things get back to normal. <laughs> or maybe, well, I guess this is just our new normal. Or how many said, um, I guess we're living in uncertain times. Well, the amazing thing about all those statements is that uh, in any one of them, we're talking about past situation or present situation, but uncertainty is where I really want to kind of focus the attention on right now. Because if we're saying that we're living in uncertain times, please tell me when we ever had certainty. Please tell me when, when the next day I knew exactly what was going to happen to me in my life. We never had those things. And so we have to look at how we, our mindset began shifting. What caused us to lose oxygen out of our environment, whether we're an athlete or a coach? How do we show up in those moments? And what can we learn from those moments? When I look at Regis Woods here, and he's doing the long jump, right? Um, I, I, I began to think about this from these terms, that mindset really is the oxygen needed to survive our environments. Oxygen, uh, the mindset is really the oxygen needed to survive our environments. So let's take a look at this real quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can actually get this video to, to, to run and work. We're gonna go out to the park and I want, I'd invite you to, to, to think about what is the fear that you believe I overcame in this, in this, uh, in this, in this situation. So here's, before we get into the video, we're gonna talk about this, this new normal. So in the chat box, please put in there, if you are sick of the term, the new normal, just put in the chat. How many of you are sick? of the term, the new normal, right? Uh, just put that in the chat. I want to see who, who's out there saying uh, what, what your thoughts are around that. How many are sick? Scott says, me, I'm totally sick of it. Yes, Emma Perks says, yes. Uh, Willie says that, yes, me, me, all these me's. Yes, I want to give you a different perspective around the term, the sick and tired, says Jim. I'm sick and I'm tired of the term, you know. <laughs> so Don says Dan White. So let me, let me share with you a little bit different perspective because I've been using the term now for, uh, since my injury uh, for about 20, a little over 27 uh, years, about 27 years. Uh, and, and here's why I, I use this term. One is when we look at the term, the new normal, we have to look at new as no prior point of reference, no prior point of reference. So if new is no prior point of reference, how many of us have ever, ever lived through COVID before? None of us. So why were you trying to do something old to, to fit into something new, whether an athlete or coach? We lost all these things off our calendar. All events were canceled. And we began to try to figure out how we're going to do things differently. We started figuring some things out, but new is no prior point of reference. So if we have grown since that time, why were we using something that was old to try to create something that was actually new? So that's the first thing. New is no prior point of reference. Normal, when we break the word down, then, is uh, the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action. So I ask, what were the rituals that we had in place? The rituals that elevated us to our rhythm, the rhythm that created a rise, the rise that created a result in our life. What were the things that we did to embrace this new normal mindset? I said last year, in the, in the, uh, when we were talking about the breakfast, that the words sidious, altius, fortius, the Latin words of swifter, higher, stronger, which are beloved to us because they were written in 776 BC and inspiring Olympians and Paralympians since that time, that those words, swifter, higher, stronger, are not written in the superlative of the word. It's not swiftest, highest, or strongest. They're written with this ER stem ending. And that's critical because we can be the swiftest today and swifter tomorrow. Jump the highest today like Stacy, right? And jump higher tomorrow. We can lift the heaviest weight like her, her husband, Ion, and be, lift heavier weight tomorrow. Those are the things that we have to think about because that's the adaptability. We are always going to press. If Olympians and Paralympians are training four years from today, that the way they're training today, they've already lost the gold medal. How do we shift? How do we focus? So the new normal is not, will things get back to normal? Or this is our new normal as most people are using it and that most people are sick of how we're using those, those, ter those terminologies. No, the new normal really then is only 
a destin it's not a destination it's a plateau by which we grow it's a plateau by which we grow so let's take a look we're going to go out to a park have a good time out the park watch the ducks but I, I invite you to ask what do you think i overcame when i had to embrace my new normal mindset and we will quickly uh, if you can't hear the video, we'll quickly shift so I can actually do a different thing so we can hear the video. So here we go. Let's get ready to go off the park. October the 30th, 2000. I'm sitting in a date waiting area in the San Francisco International Airport. I'm reading a USA Today newspaper. I'm wearing shorts, which has exposed my artificial leg. <laughs> In earshot of me, about 20 yards off to my left, your right, two boys about five and seven are talking to their mother and these two boys have made a new discovery. Mommy, mommy, look at that mass label. There's that mass label and there goes robot man. <laughs> so I chuckled, but I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. Then something else happened. There began to be this outer speak conversation, which really should have remained inner speak conversation about the two boys, five and seven, who has just discovered Robot Man. Check those kids up. So impolite to stare. Such a bad mother. Leave that poor man alone. I said, wow, now that's interesting. But I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the woman get up and begin to move in my direction. Now, I thought she was going to do like the song said and just walk on by. But no, she stops in front of me, leans in and says, excuse me, sir, it looks like you've overcome so much adversity. My children are fascinated by your leg. You're such an inspiration. Would you please tell them what happened? In that moment, I was taken aback. No one has ever asked me such a direct question in front of all these people loud enough for them to hear all the naysayers that were there that were talking this inner speak outer speak conversation and in the space between her question and my response i began to try to figure out how i was going to answer her question and the space gave me pause why did she think i'd overcome so much adversity maybe i was just born this way and why did she think that i was such an inspiration I could be an axe murderer. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> and then why was everybody else that had that inner speed conversation, that was not outer speed conversation, leaning in? And in that space between her question and my response, I found my answer. I did not overcome the adversity. You see, six and a half years earlier, I was lying on a hospital bed in Wichita, Kansas, at the Wesley Medical Center. My wife, Alice, was holding on to my left hand. My parents were on the opposite side of the bed, and my son, John Jr., was at the foot of the bed. Dr. Randy Mullins, who walks into the room, wearing a white lab coat, stethoscope around his neck, clipboard in his hand, he takes one look at me and sees my countenance because the pain that I am in is tremendous. And as he looks at me, he says, John, you have, a, you have a tough choice to make. You can either keep your leg and, I, and you can use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life, or I can amputate your leg and you can use a prosthesis for the rest of your life. Now, what kind of choice is that? You see, just seven days earlier on May 17th, 1994, I'm on top of the world. <laughs> I am on the Army's world-class athlete program team. I am a four-time All-American, twice in the Olympic trials. USA Track and Field News has picked me to make the Olympic team one of the favorites to watch for the 1996 Games because I'm top eight, top 20 in the world. And I'm doing my shakeout in the 400-meter hurdles. I'm in Hayes, Kansas, and the wind's blowing kind of hard that day, and I'm having trouble with my steps. So on the 40 meter hurdle, which is one time around the track, over 10 barriers spaced 35 meters apart with a 45 meter lead into the first hurdle and a 40 meter runoff on the last hurdle, I'm approaching each hurdle at the speed of about 
8.7 meters per second, which equates to what? If you put in the chat box <laughs> uh, 19 miles an hour, you'd be absolutely correct if you didn't do a Google search on it. So I'm going pretty fast. Somebody probably said pretty fast out there. So I'm having trouble with my steps. My right leg's coming up. My left leg's coming up. And sometimes in hurdles as in life, we just want things to stay the same. And I want that right leg to come up because that was my dominant leg to go down the back stretch for this hurdle race. So I get the blocks and I do my one last proverbial pass. I'm gonna shut it down after this one. And I come out of blocks and I get my steps to the first hurdle. I'm on, right leg leads. Second hurdle, 13 steps in between the hurdle. Again, right leg leading, I'm on again. And then I feel the Kansas wind push against me, but I push back against that Kansas wind. And I realize I'm gonna be short and have to take the hurdle with my left leg. No problem, I'm ambidextrous, I can do that. Don't want to, but I can. So off the right leg, I go across the hood of my left leg. When I land, this time I hear, and my body sails and twists in the air, and I see my left shin pass in front of my face. My shoulders hit the ground, and I bounce to a halt. I did a quick once up in my body, you know, my, my shoulders are okay, my, my waist is okay. When I saw my knee, the patella had risen three inches up my femur bone with my left leg was now canted across my right with my foot touching the black surface of the track. Now let me stick a pin in the story right there and pause for just one moment. I'm gonna show you a graphic. And on this graphic, you're gonna see the actual injury of my leg because a sharp lieutenant named Michelle Dickens took nine pictures that day. The next picture I want to show you is a picture of that injury. But if you're a little bit squeamish, you can look away from your computer monitor right now, wherever you're watching this, the stream from. So as you can see, on the bottom of the picture is my foot on the black surface of the track. If you come up my shin bone, you will see the dislocation of my knee, the left knee right there. That's not an elbow, ladies and gentlemen. That's my knee. And then when you come all the way down to the, the bottom left-hand side of the corner, you see my head. My friend Dino's head is resting on my head. My friend um, Ben Curitan is kind of on there with, with Dino. Roz is holding my hand. And then I have no idea whose ashy legs those are in the, in, the, in the picture. Let me step back onto the track. The only thing I could think about in that moment was just get up. Come on, John, you can do it. It's okay, you got it, you got you got that you get you get yourself up. Come on, you can oh 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 god. And then 90 minutes later, with my friends singing songs and hymns to keep me calm, 90 minutes later, as they were trying to get me medical attention, 90 minutes later, the ambulance comes. And I'm put in the back and I'm whisked off to Hayes Medical Center, where another doctor in the white lab coat comes in, takes one look at me and says, Mr. Register, looks like you got a bit of a problem. I'm gonna have to fix that. So he bore down on my crooked leg. We're gonna do this on three. One, <clears throat> my leg ballooned up, I passed out. And for the next few days, seven days, I don't really remember too much what happened. I was met back to Wesley Medical Center. I underwent several vein graft operations. I don't remember when my wife arrived. I don't remember when my son got there or my parents. What I do remember is laying in that hospital bed with Alice, her hand on my left hand, my parents on the opposite side of the bed, Will John Jr., five and a half years old, for the bed, and Dr. Mullen saying, you've got a tough choice to make. Now, it was the pain that spoke first because my male deductive region said, get rid of the leg, get rid of the pain. So I turned to Dr. Mullins and I said, I know it has to be amputated. And he went in right away. Two days later, I woke up at 11 o'clock at night and I was in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reason. I just wanted something to knock it out. So I saw the morphine drip button on the opposite side of the bed. I just wanted to roll over to depress the button, but I was too weak from the surgery to do so. 
but I saw the nurses station right outside my door and I thought if I'd call out to them, but the tubes that have been down my throat make the sound too inaudible to get their attention. So there I lay in my bed for the next eight hours with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What's my identity? My wife going to stick around with me? Will my son still see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the army? Do I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. And at 8 o'clock, Dr. Randy Mullins, he walks back in the room, takes one look at me and sees I've done a 180 degree shift. He immediately calls my wife, Alice, who's over at the hotel, trying to manage me, herself, John Jr., her mother-in-law. She should have been told I was awakened, but because I couldn't speak and because no one had come in and checked on me, you know, in the moments as I was, you know, in and out of that consciousness, she didn't know. She had been there all the time. On top of that, the same of a woman has just gotten a call from her employer saying that she's been away from her job too long caring for me and they've just terminated her position. So she comes running over and it takes Dr. Mullins and my wife Alice 45 minutes to get me out of that bed into a wheelchair wheeled out to an inaccessible playground where I'm parked. Watching, forced to watch my wife and my son play on the swing set and I could have pushed myself out of that chair. It's the first time I felt devalued, rejected, disabled. And I lost it, started crying uncontrollably. My wife, Alice, who sees me struggling, she comes running over to me, kneels down beside me and says, babe, what is going on? What is wrong? And I started articulating to her everything that was going on in my life the night before. And then she spoke the words that stopped my downward spiral. You know what, John? We're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. <laughs> and when she spoke those words, I remember she baselined my entire existence with those words. And as I started contemplating and thinking about this, this new normal concept that she was just kind of throwing into my, my life at this point, John Jr. jumps off the swing, hits the ground, comes running over his little five and a half year old legs. Hey dad, you see my big jump? You see my big jump dad? And in those 20 yards, he had just validated me as his father and he had just created his new normal. And that's exactly what I had to do. I had to create my new normal. Let's take a pause right there and just unpack what we've just heard. So, okay, we're about to take a breath. Ah, get out of it right now, okay. Uh, what was it that you think overcame? I'm gonna look in the chat and keep watching in the chat over there. However, uh, I'm gonna keep on pushing through just because of, for, I wanna make sure we honor the time today. And just to take, cause I talked about this last year, but I've been thinking a whole lot about this. I don't think we need to go broad in what we have overcome. I think we need to go deeper into what we've overcome so that next time we go through something like this, we have something to draw on, something to, to pull us over. Uh, Arnetta says those powerful words, when you get through it, yes, we have to go. And hopefully you have shifted your mindset a little bit about how you think about the term, the new normal for uh, at least right now, right? Uh, so I think that there, there are three things, one or, or there are nine things. The first is we overcome our individual fear, others fear and culture fear. Uh, what I was experiencing, was uh, when I said my wife might not stick around is what I saw other people do when I came back from the Gulf War. I saw a lot of spouses break up. I saw a lot of uh, families not make it. And so that's what, what my, one of my thoughts that was, but the fear was not her leaving. The fear was, am I still desirable? Do people still want me, like me, want me around, hang around? My whole group has just now shifted. All these people that I was trying to make an Olympic team with, go to officer candidate school with, are now not going to be a part of this, this new existence moving forward. And I have doctors, nurses, all these other people that are now new in my life around me. So that was my fear. Would I still be accepted? Uh, that, was, that was the first one. The second one, I think, is, is the fear of, of others, right? The fear of others. Other people believing for us what we can or cannot do, which is based upon what they believe they could or could not do if they were in our situation. How many folks were telling us how to show up and we were believing them during the pandemic? 
The third thing then is the culture of fear. What, who, who was I listening to from the cultural standpoint? What was society telling me to believe about myself in this moment? So the, the process then is how do we turn away from it? How do we turn out from this thing? And I think the first part is we, we, we believe we're rebuilding, but it's like a false sum. We're not really rebuilding at all. And here's why, because when I was trying to prepare for a TEDx talk, I realized that had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. We don't get those things back that have been amputated. And all of us went through an amputation in March of 2020. We all had something severed, full stop, on what we were dealing with. In fact, we had what I call phantom pains. I still get phantom pains because we the limb's not there, but we're still longing to go back to what was there and it's painful for us we're, we're thinking about it. So we don't get those things back. So the question I have then is, what do you anticipate getting back that's now holding you back from your new normal mindset? What are those things? And then we look at, from this standpoint, now we got to go through our redefining moment. This is when we just have the birth of a vision. We don't have the whole vision. We just only have a glimpse of it, of what might be possible. And when we have that hope that's right there, hope might not be a plan, but if you don't have hope, you definitely don't get a vision because you can't even see the possibility of what is next. So you can't have anything else to move it forward until you start having the vision. And I believe that when our truth outweighs our fear, we will commit to a courageous life. We will commit to courageous acts. But our truth has to outweigh the fear first. And when it does, we can see ourselves in a way forward because that's when we get to the release point. The jump is the jump. That's what I love to say. Stacy jumps, Willie jumps. Um, the jump is the jump. And all of us have our own jump to do. No one does a jump uh, with somebody else pushing them. We can encourage, we can get the clap going and, 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 and get behind somebody, but only that individual on the, on the pole vault runway, on the long jump runway, on the triple jump runway, uh, whatever runway you wanna be on, only that person can do the jump. We can't make them do it. Uh, so that's the, the greatest thing about being a coach or being an athlete. Coaches can encourage, coaches can give us the tools, but only the athlete gets out there and can actually put the work and the practice together to see if we're gonna get down the road. And once we do make this jump, the high jump as Dick Bosberg changed the whole game on it, right? Uh, when we do make the jump, then we get into this rebirth moment. And the rebirth moment is very hard. We think it's gonna be easy. I made the commitment, so it should be good. I should be good now. No, this is where the work begins. You make the commitment to show up on the track that day. Now's a commitment time. We're going to talk about that in plus one days in our, in our workshop we're going to have. How we get plus one days, and I'll explain that later in the, in the workshop. Uh, and then from there, uh, after we know that the commitment is hard, we get into this resolve. We have, have, we've taken so much time now uh, that we are now resolute. I know exactly how I'm showing up. I am powerful. I, I know exactly who I am. I'm never going back to the way it used to be. I'm not going back to the others. I'm not going back to society. Society, others, you need to catch up to where I am. That's where we want to be in the resolve. And then finally, that equals our liberation. Our cage is open. We want, we, we, we reached the mountaintop. We've got, we won the medals or whatever the goal was that was set before us in our, in our life. But that's not enough because we realize that that's a past performance. Medals represent a past state of existence. No one cares after you won an Olympic medal the next year because they're all gunning for you. They're in the city of Altius Fortius. They want to be better than you the next year. So that's why we want to go back and we want to build this pathway for others as coaches, as athletes. Who are we trying to build legacy for from individual fear through their redefining moment into their liberation? And that's where we are right there in that, in that spot. So the fears that we have, thanks to Arnetta for saying those words right there. We're going to see how this story actually ends. Uh, and then we'll close up our time and get ready to, to move out to our, um, our our breakout sessions. All right. So uh, hopefully you can see that. If you saw that video, it's pretty clear. Uh, we'll get ready to, to do that. Uh, thanks, Willie. I appreciate that uh, on that. So here's a, the quickly, you know, that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately is when our truth outweighs fear, we commit to a courageous life. When truth outweighs fear, I'll leave it up there just for a second. If you want to take a picture of it, do a snapshot of it, you know, wherever you're looking at it from. Um, and then, you know, we, we want to make sure that's, that's, you know, pushing out there to, to make the Simplot games know all the value that we're getting from it. So uh, three more seconds, two, one, and we're about to move forward. Okay, here we go. Uh, so what happens next, right, is what the woman says in the airport. Uh, 
you, you've done all these things and you, you what, what was the next thing to happen so i'm going to tell you that right now in this quick little video what happens so next. the new normal is really about no prior point of reference that's what new is that we're not going to hold on to our past performances our past successes our past failures that's gone and normally the everyday typical occurrence of a thought idea or an action and so when we're talking about the new normal, it's how are you pivoting? How, what are you doing right now to increase to the next level? I took the new normal philosophy and began swimming for physical therapy. I got so fast in the water that I somehow fluked up, messed up, and made the Paralympic swim team. So instead of going to the Olympic Games as a 400-meter hurdler, I went to the Paralympic Games as a swimmer, African-American swimmer. My brother just didn't do that sport too much. <laughs> It was at those games that I saw athletes running and jumping on artificial limbs, and that birthed the idea of how I could press more into this new normal, right? It's, it's because it's not a destination. It's only a plateau to grow. So I had a leg made for running. And after four years, learning how to run, learning how to jump, getting myself fit and fast, I wound up making the Paralympic team, and I went to Sydney, Australia, and these were the results. Let's take a look at the men's long jump F42 final starting list. And Lucas Quiston from Switzerland is the dominant one in this field. He holds both the world and Paralympic record in this event. Victor Goriansson from Sweden is up now, ready for his third attempt. It's not a bad effort. He's pretty satisfied with it. 4.89. It's actually a season best for the Swede. Here's the man to beat. He is the world record holder, jumping 5.43 in 98 in Birmingham. Well, he's pleased the crowd. He's happy with that one. And so he should be. He smashed his world mark with 5.57, a new world mark. Well, the pressure's really on now for John Register from the USA. 5.57, the mark to beat. Nice lead up, but it's short. He's not able to take the gold from Kristen, but he does move into second spot. So here are the results of the men's long jump final. Gold to Kristen, silver to register, and Goriansen home with the bronze. Woo, all the hand claps. There's a, there's a silver right there, bringing it all back <laughs> in. Every time I see that video, I say it all the time, I think I'm gonna win the gold medal. I wanna be like Stacy. who uh, I wanna be like Stacy. <laughs> So, um, but what we can, we can have these moments. So we talked about a lot of things today, right? We talked about how we are embracing this fear from fear to freedom. Uh, a reporter said after, you know, in the mix zone, when you get down after you win the medal, uh, she says to me, John, you ran against Michael Johnson, jumped against Carl Lewis. Do you think with artificial limb technology that you can do the same thing and jump against those gentlemen and run against those gentlemen again in another Olympics? And I thought about her question and then I said, no. However, maybe the question should be, God forbid if Michael Johnson or Carl Lewis lost a limb, could they run as fast and jump as far as I do? Because that's a whole different question. It's a whole different mindset that we have to have uh, to, to, to make that conversation move forward. So really quickly, here are some of the insights that I gathered. I'll just go run through some of these really fast. And I know I went through, blew through that, that, pro, that model really quickly because that's like a whole half year workshop type thing we do. Um, so the first thing is, you know, the woman is a heroine because despite all the naysayers in the gate waiting area, she took the risk. She's the one that opened up an opportunity for her children, even not even knowing how I was going to show up for her in that moment and for her kids. She took the risk. And so how many, how much, how many times do we take risks when something new has come in our lives? I think the next thing are, are the support elements that we have around us. All these individuals are around me. Dino's head's on my head. Ben Curitan, he has his head resting on the back of Dino's head, cradling my head underneath my arm. You see my outstretched arm with my fist in a ball because of the pain. And we see Tony Sylvester in the white ball cap. He is the one that's um, a, a combat medic. And he has saved many lives over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he has got his eyes locked on me in case I open my eyes up. And we see the EMT who is now setting my leg. Who are the ones that can support you when you cannot support yourself? I see that all the time happen. Um, and then finally, where are they now? My wife and I, we've been married 32 years. We'll be 33 in August of this year. Yes, thanks for the hand clap, Stacey. Uh, then my son, of course, is he's, he's in Hawaii, about to come back today. He's with his fiance now. Uh, so we can't wait to see his next iteration of his life. Uh, then we have Ashley. You know, that's a picture of her when we went to Hawaii too. 
Um, I'm, I'm, Hawaii's my Zen spot. So, but uh, but Ashley's here because you know one of those things I fears I had in the hospital. Ashley's here because everything still worked. And then finally we have uh, we have Ayana who is my heartbeat. That's John Jr.'s daughter, uh, and we just love her to life. So uh, so remember, you know, we have our our mindsets that need to shift, bring our oxygen back into our environments and how we shift to make this new normal that's a plateau by which we grow using the Olympic model of Sidious Altius Fortius, the Latin words when translated into English are swifter, higher, and stronger. So thanks for, so much for your time today. You've been awesome. And as we always say here, go forth and inspire your world because go is your command, forth is your direction, inspire is your vocation, your, it's your DNA, only you can do it in world. It's your sphere of influence. Go forth and inspire your world, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Back to, uh, I think it's Dick, or who is it? Who am I giving over to? I forgot. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, I'm good to Lisa. <laughs> awesome, John. Wasn't that?